Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel Greenberg. I am speaking today from the Aurora Academic Journal, and I'm here with our special guest, Dr. Gabriel Veneziano. He is an Italian theoretical physicist that is considered to be one of the founding fathers of string theory. He has conducted most of his scientific activities at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, and held the chair of elementary particles, gravitation, and cosmology at College de France in Paris from 2013 to 2004 to 2013. Currently, he is a Sackler professor at the Tel Aviv University in Israel. How are you today? Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, all right. So my first question is, what inspired you to pursue physics as a passion? And was there any significant moments that pushed you towards the subject? Well, uh, I, I would think that what started me thinking about uh, physics, going to, to career in physics, was already my high school professor in Florence, uh, who was a professor of mathematics and physics, and he, he was a very good professor. He gave very inspiring you know, lessons, and uh, I remember that uh, we were three guys in the same class, and all three debated in the summer of 1960 whether to go for math or for physics. And eventually all three of us decided to go for physics. So I enrolled at the University of Florence in 1960 and, um, and got my first degree in 65. And uh, well, at that point, um, uh, there was no PhD program in, uh, in Italy. And so I was looking around whether there was some possibility to get a PhD elsewhere. And eventually I decided to go to Israel for my PhD. And um, so this was the, the, the beginning of the, of the story. I think I got to also, I was also very lucky with my Italian professor, you know, my mentor or my direct thesis director in Florence, Professor Gatto. And uh, so when I got to the Weizmann Institute to pursue the studies towards a PhD, you know, I had already quite a broad culture in that field. And uh, I managed to get my PhD just in a couple of years. So at the end of 67, I, I graduated. Now, uh, you asked what uh, brought me into that particular direction of physics, I guess. So that is also, you know, some kind of uh, circumstances. Uh, at some point, I remember in 63, um, um, I was approached by a group of experimental physicists who wanted to get me, you know, make a thesis with them. And so I was about to become an experimental physicist. However, that same year, this professor I mentioned, Gatto, arrived in Florence with a group of young people, mainly from Rome, and he created such a stimulating atmosphere that I, I said no to the experimental uh, professors. And, uh, and I decided to ask Professor Gatto for, you know, for a thesis in theoretical physics. So that's how I, I took that road. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, my next question is, um, why specifically string theory? Why, why is that, why did, why did that interest you? Okay, so this is really a, a rather long story. And, um, and um, uh, the, the point is that um, it became string theory only much later. So at that time, um, my interest was focused more on the physics of 
strong interactions. These are the interactions which work at the nucleus level in an atom, which bind protons and neutrons into uh, the nucleus. And, uh, and at that time, I'm talking about the mid-60s, there was no decent theory for those interactions. It was, you know, there were models which covered one or another aspect of that kind of interactions, but there was no good theory. And people uh, were started to think that the methods that were, had been successfully applied to electromagnetic interactions uh, could not be applied equally well to the strong interactions, that you needed really something else. And so um, when I went to my, for my PhD to, to Israel, to the Weizmann Institute, um, uh, my, my unofficial advisor was a, prof a young professor from Argentina, Hector Rubinstein, and, uh, and we started to think about some new approach to that problem understanding better the strong interactions. And, um, and so that, okay, to make a long story short, uh, a couple of years later, in 68, led me to propose a model to describe how, you know, a collision among uh, strongly interacting particles like protons, neutrons, pions. By then, there were really a big zoo of such particles known, uh, how they would interact. So this was a, a, a model for describing the strong force. And at the beginning, you know, it was a rather mysterious object that people didn't quite understand because it was neither a standard approach like the one we, we used for electromagnetic interactions. Maybe you have heard the word, the word QED, quantum electrodynamics. So it was not like that. It was not also uh, another type of um, formalism, which was called S-metric theory, was not exactly that either. So it was a mysterious object, okay? So that was 68. Now, um, then slowly people started to generalize the model, to extend it, to study it. In particular, I myself did some work on that. Uh, as a postdoc, because after graduating from Weizmann, I went to MIT. And there I worked mainly with Professor Sergio Fubini. And together we, un we, we uncovered some interesting structure between, uh, be behind the model. In particular, there were some kind of vibration modes that an infinite number of different vibration mode for the underlying object. And so some people started early on to say, oh, maybe, maybe it's a string, you know, but that was maybe 1970. And it took another two years before uh, it was definitely proven that, um, that indeed, that model represented the interaction, not of two point-like particles, but the interaction of two string-like objects, namely extended objects. And uh, very crucially, it was uh, so at the quantum level, namely uh, to take classical strings would not have produce the result. You needed strings with quantum mechanics. So the, the interaction of quantum strings was the picture behind the model I had proposed in 68. 
However, it was still a model for the strong interactions, okay? Now, perhaps, yeah, perhaps if I can share the screen, I have one picture uh, I try, yeah? Yes, you can definitely share the screen. Okay, but I thought, mm -hmm. just a moment. You see, you see my desktop, right? Yes. Okay, so I think this. Let's see. I I wanted to make the following. So, you see, um, so the, the, the interesting question is why, by looking at strong interactions, we ended up discovering string theory, okay? That, that is the first question I would like to address. And the reason is the following, a posteriori, now we know that the correct theory of strong interaction is not that theory that we were working on in the late 60s or early 70s. The true, the correct theory of the strong interactions is a theory where, uh, where strongly interacting particles are made of quarks, antiquarks, which are bound together by a force which prevents the quarks to escape, okay? The quarks and the antiquarks are permanently bound together. It's a little bit, I make this analogy with a magnet in which, maybe it's the next slide. In a magnet, we know there is a, a North Pole and the South Pole and if we can try to pull the two poles, uh, you know, um, out um, away from each other, you can't. At some point, the magnet may break down, and what happens? You produce another south and north poles. So you, you get from one from one magnet, you get two magnets, but you can never separate what would be called a monopole. A, a magnetic charge. And uh, somehow that's how the, uh, the world of strong interaction works. The quarks and the antiquarks are like a, a, a north and the south pole of a magnet, and you cannot separate them from one another. You cannot bring one to infinity, say. So, uh, and now, you understand this confinement, what is called co confinement of quarks, as the fact that as you try to, to stretch this, the, you know, to apply a force and separate the quark from the antiquark, you produce a thin tube of, of, uh, of it's, it's, a, it's, it's an interact, it's like in, indeed a, a a, a string in the sense that it resists uh, extending it, it has a tension, and therefore, if you put some energy to try to separate the two, you simply stretch more and more the string. So, uh, a posteriori, one understands uh, that the reason why we discovered, in a sense, accidentally string theory is because we were trying to make sense of the strong interactions and the strong interactions have features which are close but not exactly identical to the string that we discovered at the time. So, uh, so, the, uh, so at that point, um, string theory uh, was working only at a qualitative level, but for strong interactions, but not at a quantitative level. And eventually 
people like myself and many, many others gave up on string theory, on this fundamental string theory as a theory of strong interactions. Although people who do the quark theory still talk all the time about the string, about the string tension. And so certainly there is a string in the strong interactions, but it's much more complicated than the simple, elegant, elementary string that we, that we invented at the time. So was there for that simple string to be completely abandoned? Well, for 10 years, it looked like that. Say between 74 and 84, practically nobody was working on, on the old string, except perhaps a few guys. Among them, there were a couple of guys called uh, Michael Green and John Schwartz. And in 84, they made a, a, a decisive step forward and showed that, uh, that that old string theory could be instead a good theory for gravity, for, for quantum gravity. So this is the new incarnation of the old string theory that people are very excited about. I don't know if, I mean, this was a very short review of many, many years of, uh, of work. So it went like this, you know, there was a, a very big interest at the beginning. Then the excitement cooled down a lot when you saw that the, there were still problems with, the, uh, with that theory of strong interactions. But then there was this resurrection of the theory uh, with a reinterpretation. But please, if you have questions, I'm sure it's not that simple. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's very fascinating. Thank you for explaining. Um, but I, I would like to move on to the next question, okay. which, um, which is, like, I know that you have some experience at CERN. So mm -hmm. I know that like if string theory is so accurate, why, um, why haven't CERN discovered or made uh, more subatomic particles from that theory? Um, let's see, can, can you repeat uh, the, uh, the, main, the main point? Namely, you say if string theory is... Uh, it's so accurate. It's so important why they didn't find such things, okay? Or right. why didn't they discover them, if you want, at the, in an experiment? That's a very good question. Uh, and it is very much related to the previous discussion. Namely, the original string had a, a, a size, okay, a typical characteristic size, which is given, by the way, by quantum mechanics. Namely, you have to combine the, the Planck constant of quantum mechanics, the string tension, the speed of light, you form a length scale. And that length scale in the old theory for strong interaction was, you know, the same size of a proton or of a nucleus, if you want. It's, a, it's called one Fermi, it's 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, or minus 15 meters. Now, then in the new reformulation of the theory, the one which supposedly applies to gravity, and by the way, not only to gravity, but also to all other interactions, it's supposed to be a unified theory of all interactions, now you'll tell me, but if you fail to explain the strong interactions, how come you now claim that that same theory can be a theory of all interactions? You already failed for one, it cannot be the right theory. Okay, the, the, the reason why it can is that in the new reformulation, there is a huge rescaling of the size of the string. 
by some 20 orders of magnitude. So while the old string was accessible to experiments because, okay, that kind of size, the size of the, of the, of the nucleus, it's explorable. You know, you can test it at the present acceleration. The size, the new size of strings is so much smaller then, you know, an accelerator is like a big microscope, but still it cannot see structures which are that small. So the accelerator cannot distinguish at present a, 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 such a small string from a point. It cannot resolve the structure. So, um, so that's why direct search of strings is very difficult. So what you have, so the alternatives are, in my opinion, two. One is forget about accelerator physics, forget about CERN, and use instead the universe or the early universe as a very big accelerator because we know that in the early universe, the energies of everything which was there at the beginning were extremely high, much higher than the energy we can produce on Earth by accelerating particles. So that means you have to appeal to cosmological observation, that observations that look back in time till the Big Bang, if you want. And we know that we can look back in time at the Big Bang. And, you know, as I may argue later, if you are interested, even before the Big Bang, if you define properly what is the Big Bang. Uh, and th so th this is not something unheard. In fact, one can look at... Uh, the universe around that time, it would be even easier to do so by detecting gravitational waves. And we know that now we know how to detect gravitational waves. And so the hope is to find in this early universe some imprints of strings, which will be characteristic of having strings instead of a more ordinary kind of elementary particles. This is number one, one possibility that, in fact, for many years now, I have been mostly doing cosmology rather than particle physics. The other possibility is to see indirect consequences of string theory, which uh, are there even at, at low energy. By low energy may mean ac present accelerator energy, which are still quite high but say much smaller than the one I was alluding to before. And indeed, string theory does make some predictions at, at large distances or so low energies, which, okay, in a sense contradict what many people say, that string theory can never be will never be tested, cannot be proven wrong, cannot be falsified, and therefore is not a real scientific theory, okay, if it cannot be falsified. That's not true, and in fact, the, the old string is a very good example of that. Uh, it was abandoned for, as a theory of strong interactions, not only because it didn't make some good predictions at the high energies at, at the time, but also it had low energy wrong predictions, like it was predicting the existence of some massless particles that we, we don't see, long range forces that we don't see. And similarly, the new theory of strings, if you, you, you look at its solution at some lowest order approximation, it's, in, it's already inconsistent with the data. So you have to hope that somehow as you solve string theory 
more accurately or exactly, <laughs> hopefully, then you will find that uh, that those difficulties disappear. But that's an example that I often give to show that uh, to to argue that. Uh, it is not true that you cannot falsify string theory, so that those accusations are not really well founded. Thanks. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. The string theory has so many opportunities, and I do believe it's like a it's a very real and accurate theory. Um, but I'll, I want to say, like, is this what you're working on right now? When you said you're you're working on more in cosmology, so is there a project mm -hmm. that you're working on at the moment, or well, yeah, that, that is one direction in which I have been working actually uh, since the early 90s, so it's already 30 years. And, um, uh, and, uh, and indeed, uh, it, it, it's quite interesting that string theory may have its own favorite cosmology, if you want. Um, by the way, the two main directions in which I have been working uh, since, since the early 90s are indeed cosmology, mainly as inspired by string theory, but not only. And the other thing I'm doing is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on gravitational waves from, you know, from collisions of particles and so on. That has not much to do with string, not necessarily. So coming to cosmology, which I think is very exciting as a subject, uh, one thing I'm trying to stress with colleagues or also to bring this to the big public is the fact that in modern cosmology, the, the role of the Big Bang has to be reconsidered completely. And uh, this, I think, even... My own colleagues sometimes do not appreciate this point, but it's pretty straightforward. And it's related to the fact that uh, the, the new cosmology, which has prevailed since the early 80s, and it's fairly well established by now by experiments, uh, contains this uh, uh, epoch in the early universe in which there was a very, very fast expansion of the universe called inflation, uh, because it's an accelerated expansion. You know, the, if you want, the size of the universe doubles every so many seconds or years or microseconds, or whatever. And uh, so it's a very fast expansion, which cools down the universe. You know, the expansion of the universe, we know, has cooled down the cosmic microwave background down to 2.7 degree Kelvin, so very near the absolute zero. Well, during inflation, it's even worse. I mean, even if you started inflation with a rather high temperature, the inflation cools down the temperature practically to zero Kelvin. So, on the other hand, you do need a hot Big Bang at some point because that explains many things that happened in the early universe, like the formation of light nuclei, and also the origin of the microwave background is the Big Bang itself. So, the, the, so when, if you ask a, a cosmologist, who, who, who takes um, uh, takes inflation as the correct theory, and there are many reasons to for that. Uh, it, it's necessary to place the Big Bang as the end of inflation. Uh, at the end of inflation, you need a mechanism which is most likely, almost certainly, a quantum phenomenon to reheat the universe. The universe has cooled down, and that would not be good phenomenologically. So you have to find a mechanism to 
release this heat, reheat the universe to a sufficiently high temperature that some processes can take place, the cosmic microwave background is generated and so on. So also modern cosmology needs a big bang, but that big bang is not singular. There is nothing like a beginning of time at the big bang because there is no nothing that prevents you from going before. And, uh, and of course, it's not singular and it's not the beginning of time. Uh, inflation took place before the Big Bang. <laughs> now, what went on before the inflation itself, that's a very open question and very difficult one. And that's where perhaps string theory can say something because... Uh, because we think that in string theory there is no place for a singularity, for something where everything blows up and goes to infinity, precisely this finite size of strings prevents them for, for making a universe which is infinitely dense, infinitely hot, infinitely curved, and so on. Somehow string theory doesn't like infinities. It has this... Uh, this, this cutoff which prevents reaching anything infinite. So this is the kind of things I'm, I, I've been thinking about in cosmology. Very interesting. Cool. So as you know, um, all of us at the TAAJ, we are high school students. And, um, you know, a lot of us are, um, they, all of us love um, string theory or quantum mechanics or quantum physics. Um, um, and those fields. So it, what could you like explain, like to summarize string theory for a high school student? Okay, so uh, what I usually do, uh, <laughs> maybe I show again my, uh, my sure. little slide. Yeah. A, a, a different one. Uh, let's see, I think it's like, okay. Uh, uh, String theory in a nutshell. Uh, okay, so what I'm saying is that uh, actually it's quite simple. You take uh, as you know as assumptions special relativity, the special theory of relativity, as formulated by Einstein in in 1905, quantum mechanics, very crucial, and then the assumption that everything is made of strings. So you take these three ingredients and, uh, and they make a magic cocktail. And uh, what happens is that um, quantum mechanics plays in string theory, a little bit the same role it plays for atoms. Uh, the analogy is the following. If you try to, uh, to have a, a classical picture of an atom, say an hydrogen atom consisting of a proton and an electron, well, that doesn't work. And this was one of the reasons why people invented quantum mechanics because classically the electron by going around the, the, the proton uh, goes on into some circular orbit, but we know classically that uh, motion produces electromagnetic waves, emission of electromagnetic waves, so the electron loses energy by emitting these electromagnetic waves, and in a very short time, is supposed to fall into the proton. So quantum mechanics precisely prevents that. And because of the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics keeps the electron and the proton a finite size apart. And, um, and uh, of course it's, it's all blurred a little bit because quantum mechanics doesn't tell you that there is a precise classical orbit, but on average, say the electron sits at a distance 
10 to the minus 10 meters from the proton. And this gives, so quantum mechanics gives the characteristic size of an atom. And, uh, sorry, in string theory, something similar happens. Uh, oh, okay, I, I did not have a picture of that, but somehow quantum mechanics, and you see the presence of the Planck constant here, gives the size of a string in terms of its tension. Its tension is how much energy is needed to stretch the string by a certain length. So, uh, okay, so this is, so, and, and you can understand why string theory behaves better than it's, uh, than a, you know, theory of point particles, it's because in field theory, in the conventional theory, the interactions happen at one point here. Say, if you have two particles which collide and form another particle, uh, uh, the, the interaction happens at one point. In string theory, since the string are extended object, the interaction doesn't happen at a precise point. And this is what makes the theory much softer, as we say. And then the second important aspect of quantum string theory is that it, um, it allows strings to have angular momentum without having mass. Now, a classical string cannot have angular momentum without having mass. And the reason is very simple. In order to have angular momentum, you need some spatial extension. And, uh, and since in a classical string, there is energy per unit length, this is the string tension. Uh, if you have a, a finite extension, you also must have a finite mass. So massless particles with spin do not exist in a classical field theory. Quantum mechanics, in a very magic way, that's why I call it string magic, allows for strings having spin and no mass. And now there are two examples. One is, I think it's in the next slide, an open string, which is a string with two ends. You can show that it, it can have uh, mass zero and what we call spin one. Spin one means that the spin is one in units of the Planck constant. And, uh, and this corresponds, for instance, to a photon or to other, um, what we call gauge bosons, but never mind the word, the mediators of non gravitational forces. And then, similarly, a, 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 a well defined motion of a closed string gives rise to a massless spin two string, which has to be identified with a graviton, which is, you know, the quantum of gravitational waves, in the same way as the photon is the quantum of electromagnetic waves. And the, the presence of the gravitons is what induces the gravitational force. So, as I said in this slide, all elementary particles correspond to different vibration of the same basic object, open and closed strings. And this is why this, uh, the string theory provides a unified picture, both for particles and for the forces. In fact, if you go to these extremely high energies that I was mentioning before, at which you see really the size, the finite size of the string, at those energies, gravitational interactions are of the same order as the other interactions. They're all about the same. But if you take a very light string, say one representing, say, an electron, and, uh, and you compare the electromagnetic force to the gravitational force, say for an electron proton pair, which is the, the hydrogen atom, there you find that the gravitational force is, is very weak. So 
At low energy, there is a big difference between gravity and the other interactions, but if you go to this string scale, then they are all similar to each other. So this is the, the mini presentation of, of strings. As I emphasize, it is, is, is in a sense, it's a very economic, conceptually very simple theory because, as I said, you don't need to assume much to build up a string theory. Once you say the basic objects are not point-like objects, they are strings, then you insist on quantum mechanics and relativity. The rest somehow follows. But it's a very complicated theory in the end, and um, the reason why we cannot yet test it completely is because I was saying before, uh, you have to solve this theory beyond some lowest order approximation, which in itself would not give the correct results. Uh, I mean, results which fit with the, with the experiments. And by the way, the same happens for the theory, for the good theory of strong interactions, because if you work it out at the lowest level of approximation, it predicts the existence of free quarks. And no experiment has ever seen free quarks. Quarks are, are bound together. But to prove that quarks are really indeed bound together, you need to do awfully complicated calculations. We can only be done in supercomputers. So, you know, sometimes life is not easy and, uh, and you have to, to find a way to, to, to solve a theory. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, I understood the description, and I hope that everyone else that will be watching this uh, interview will understand it as well. Um, so, speaking about like the high school students, um, is there any word or recommendation that you would like to tell students that are interested in physics, string theory, or any scientific field? Well, I, I you know, I was very lucky. Uh, inside, I mean, I, I, I arrived uh, uh, work in this field in a very good moment because, you know, with inside those 10 years from 65 to 75, say, roughly, they were crucial years for particle physics and uh, and uh, there was a lot to be done, there was a lot to be discovered. Now, um, anyway, I certainly did go into this field, you know, out of my, my own interest. I was, I found these things exciting. So my, my recommendation would, would be to go, you know, to follow your your feelings and your intuition. Of course, this is, is, is not a very easy area. It's, uh, it's very competitive. And, um, and of course, one has to, you know, one has to, to feel really um, up to it. Now, how do, how does one decide if this is the right directions or not. Um, you see, uh, in a sense, that you can refine a little bit later. For instance, in, in, in my field, you can work at different levels of rigor or of contact with the data or with experiments. So, and uh, I see, among the many colleagues I have interacted with and that I know, there are various type of, you know, for instance, theorists, theoretical physicists, and they go really from very extremely mathematical ones to people who do really very phenomenological things, very, very close to the data analysis and so on. So there is a whole spectrum 
and everybody is useful. I mean, I was once a division leader uh, at CERN, and I had to defend the role of the division vis-a-vis -vis of the organization, because, you know, some people said, well, but what are these theories doing? You know, they, uh, they have no relation to what we are doing experimentally. So I had to defend the idea that you need all this different spectrum of theoretical physicists so that each one can talk to the next one. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of synergy that you create, new ideas that maybe at first look too theoretical, but then gradually become interesting for, for the real experiments and vice versa. You know, the data filter back into the more theoretical people and inspire them to go in some directions rather than in another. So I think follow your feelings, uh, your, uh, you know, your gut feeling. If you like something, if you think some, uh, you know, some discipline, some scientific discipline is interesting, challenging enough, and, uh, and not too much above your, <laughs> your head, uh, I think one should go ahead. At least that's how we were doing at the time when I was young. Now I understand things have changed uh, and um, perhaps it's, you know, it's, it's a bit more difficult for young people to choose their own career. They have to perhaps think more uh, these days than, uh, than we used to do. And, um, but, uh, but in my opinion, yes, following your nose, you know, it's, it's very important that you enjoy and that you find what you, the work you do to be amusing. There's another point perhaps that I should add that uh, going into a scientific career in particular into physics uh, does not mean that you know you, you have necessarily to to become a great a great physicist or else you fail your life because i know of many theoretical physicists who you know left research but you know they they easily found very good jobs in other words learning physics or I guess also other scientific disciplines determines certain, uh, you know, state of your mind that makes it easy enough to adjust to other uh, jobs, other type of activity. Because, you know, you, you develop a certain critical mind, uh, you know, in inventiveness, uh, intuition, and so on and so forth, which then can be used in many other fields. You know, I, I know lots who went to, I don't know, uh, for instance, economics, things like this. I mean, uh, uh, I, one of my old collaborators became a very famous doctor, inventing certain things. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's not a waste of time. If you if you feel that the field is interesting, don't hesitate too much. Don't think that okay, so I either either I become Einstein or I fail. <laughs> okay, uh, you can still have a successful life uh, even if eventually, because it's true that competition these days is is stronger than it used to be in my days. You know, many, many more people working and uh, uh, the, the number of problems is not so different, but the number of people who look into the same problems is much higher. So there is more competition. There's also a lot of more pressure to produce results quickly to publish 
So, I mean, there are certain aspects which I feel they are a bit negative uh, uh, because, you know, sometimes to, to produce good work, you have to, you know, you have to re be relaxed, uh, not to feel too much pressure to, to write the first result you have, think more and so on. But this is, you know, that's how things go and uh, <laughs> it's very difficult otherwise. Thank you. <laughs> um, if it's okay with you, um, I'd like to ask you something a little bit more personal. Um, mm -hmm. Like with all your moves from France, Italy, um, Israel, how, how has that been going for you? Or how, how did it go for you? Was there any Something well, uh, well, um, well, in a sense, perhaps more for my family than for myself, I would say. Uh, I must say, uh, this decision of mine, for instance, to leave Italy uh, and go to Israel for a PhD, you know, many people asked me, you know, why did you do it? After all, in Italy, theoretical physics, you know, in particular in my field, was very good, and so on and so forth. But a posteriori, I found that to go, you know, from 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 Italy to Israel, for instance, for me was a very enriching experience because I could see two different ways of tackling problems. And uh, I certainly inherited a lot from Professor Gatto, but also, you know, I added onto it the experience I had in Israel. And uh, I wonder, I mean, this good work I did in 68, would I, would I have done it if I had stayed in Italy? Probably not. Or, would I have done it if I had spent all my life in Israel? I don't know. So perhaps sometimes mixing two different cultures, two different approaches and so on. And then I went to MIT and this was yet another experience for me. I spent four years there as a postdoc. So as I said, it was perhaps a bit more difficult for my wife because She's younger, so she, she, she was a little bit behind me in her career. And sometimes she had to move when maybe it was not the best time for her. But otherwise, I, I didn't find it difficult. Um, say we adjusted well to different countries. And, uh, and uh, for instance, it's... it's Many times in Italy these days, uh, people complain that there is a lot of brain drain, okay? People who, who move out of Italy. And in fact, you know, in, I find very good Italian physicists all over the world. Uh, and, but th there is nothing wrong with leaving Italy, say, <laughs> for an Italian physicist. If you then have an opportunity to go back, if you like, the difficulty is when, you know, things are hard um, for people then to choose to come back or not. And many people uh, are forced to stay abroad. But to, to have real exchanges uh, between different countries, I think this is, is, is good for everybody. So the problem, for instance, in Italy is that there are not as many foreign uh, scientists or physicists or students who like to go to, it, to Italy. <laughs> so there's an out flux and not an influx. And this, this is certainly not good for the country. But I think I'm all for traveling as changing and so on. Of course, you have then to see how this is compatible with your private life, with your uh, other interests and so on. But I would say from the, from the point of view, from the poor academic point of view, I find uh, moving from country to country 
quite a plus than a minus. And mm, for instance, I, I remember very well that uh, when I was a PhD student in Israel, uh, there was a, a strict rule. Once you get your PhD, you leave. You cannot stay in Israel. You have to look for a postdoc elsewhere. And then, okay, if you make your way, then, then you apply and you will be welcome back. But as a, as a rule, you should leave. You should get another experience, you know. And uh, I think that that is that works fine. I mean, in my opinion, it's a, it's a way to go. I mean, science has become very international. You travel from place to place. You immediately get, you know, get uh, at home, like at home, scientifically, I mean. Because people throughout the world think about very similar problems. So you immediately can interact with people scientifically. Now, then life-wise, it's different. And of course, uh, that's a much more personal thing, personal choice. But for, from the scientific point of view, I see only advantages. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I really don't have any words. It's like you can really see that it's coming from a master that you can share and uh, like how much you've managed and how much you've learned. Um, but for my last question, uh, just um, is there anything you'd like to say to us at the uh, TAAJ? Um, anything special? At this Aurora? Yeah, the Aurora yeah. Academic Chair. Well, uh, I think it's a very good initiative. When I was contacted by Dr. Kumar, I, I told him, you know, I am very sympathetic. So provided we can find the right time, the right moment, I'm all for it. You know, for instance, uh, I nowadays, I often refuse invitations to, to give lectures, to give conferences. Uh, particularly, you know, very scientific ones uh, for the, you know, for the colleagues. But when I get invitations to give general talks, you know, for the general public or to students and so on, I always make an extra effort to say yes. You know, in fact, I have some pending invitations which were suspended because of uh, COVID, but, you know, soon, hopefully, I will, uh, you know, I will resume those, those things. And, uh, no, I think it's very important for people like me, for and my colleagues to, to participate in this activity and activities. And, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm really very uh, admirative of, uh, of your organization. Now I, I, I have to get to know it better, but the general idea of blogs and sharing, uh, sharing these interviews and uh, maybe getting some people interested, it's very important. I mean, if you want to get the best minds to go into some challenging disciplines, I, you have to you have to explain what we are doing and not just you know show that we understand everything that everything is clear no you have to actually point out the problem how uh, how every step forward creates typically new questions and uh, you know for instance in my field you can say that perhaps the the particle physics, accelerator physics, is already a rather mature field. But for instance, in astrophysics, cosmology, there are many, still many unsolved problems, many issues, you know, the acceleration of the universe, matter, antimatter, inequality, and uh, there are many, many, what is dark, dark matter, dark energy, all these big, big questions. And uh, there is a lot to do and a lot. So, I mean, 
we have to explain to the to the to the young people that there are interesting things there and encourage them you know okay yeah so i like i like your initiative i think it's a and i and i want to conclude by saying that uh, please i mean if you if if this interview has, has raised questions and so on uh, do not hesitate you can also send me an email or i don't know i can follow perhaps something on the on a blog sure <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that this um, interview... Thank you for your questions and uh, best luck to you for your, for your future. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure. We'll keep in touch. Yeah, we will. All right. Th thank you again. All right. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye.